Top 9, 7, and WBLS. This is the Town Hall. NYC leaders are on with us today. We're going to be talking about police brutality and COVID-19. My name is Ebro. You can hear me on Hot 97, weekdays 6 to 10, uh, with Laura Stiles and Rosenberg. Uh, we have our first panel for the evening. We will be here for the next hour and a half. Uh, we're going to dig in on some uh, things uh, happening in our city and the United States, specifically police brutality. Um, I want to let all the panelists know right now, um, I'm not in the mood really for pleasantries and, um, and ho-hum because I, what I see is uh, American citizens protesting and ready to risk their lives uh, to let our government know that we have a sickness, we have a problem, and they want it fixed now. So I wanted to dig in on that. I'm co-hosting today with Reverend Al Sharpton. How you doing, Mr. Sharpton? I'm good. I'm mad, but I'm good. I think that you hit it right, that people are risking their lives. They're going out in a pandemic. People need to understand that. Mm -hmm. And marching, they are not even social distancing. This is going on all over the country. I was in Minneapolis. I'm on my way back tomorrow to speak at the funeral on Thursday. And from all over the country, they're risking their lives to save their lives. And we, particularly in New York, know that the first time we heard I Can't Breathe was not from George Floyd in mm -hmm. Minneapolis. It was in Staten Island with Eric Garner. And we need to see this stop, and we need to see it stop right away. They keep talking about, Reverend, y'all going to denounce the violence. I'm not with violence, but the violence started when that man put his knee on George Floyd's neck with the help of two other officers and killed him. The autopsies have vindicated that. Now, how do we hold police accountable and how do we stop this? That's what we want to talk about tonight. Well, let's bring to the show uh, first, Brooklyn yeah. District Attorney Eric Gonzalez. We also have Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez. Uh, we'll start with Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez. I would love to you to let the audience know uh, what area of New York City you represent and um, and how you feel about the current state of affairs that we uh, are talking about. Well, uh, my district covers, uh, the bulk of my district is in Brooklyn, um, and I represent also Lower Manhattan. So I represent Red Hook, Williamsburg, Brooklyn Heights, Park Slope, uh, in Queens, also Woodhaven, Ocean Park. And uh, what? how do I feel? This is a, a moment in history. The killing of George Floyd was so egregious that it really rocked our national conscience. And, you know, it reminds me of that quote of Benjamin Franklin, justice will not be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. And this is a moment where black, brown, white, uh, uh, Asians, everyone, everyone in this country were able to see in real time the killing of a black man. And it happened because of racism. So um, people are outraged and are demanding action. And this is the moment where we, we as our elected officials have to seize this moment to bring about accountability uh, for law enforcement. And, and, and we need to uh, deal with this at the federal level, at the state and city level, and we are prepared to do that. I think that this is the right moment to pursue the kind of legislative changes, the kind of reforms uh, that will unite this country that because if there's a one message that people are sending out to the president and everybody else is look at what we are doing. We are putting our bodies out there 
and they've been brutalized by the police. They have been kicked. They have been thrown into the street on the ground. Women, young women, men, even children, to see a picture of a father holding his child on his shoulder with a police officer, with a long range uh, rifle, it just, it, it really breaks our heart. But that is not enough. We need to take actions and, 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 and bring the type of accountability. And people have to, uh, to know that they will face consequences. AOC, uh, let's go to you now. Uh, what part of New York City do you represent on the federal level? And um, how are you feeling about what you're seeing in the streets right now? And what would you like people to know before we dig in further? Yeah, I mean, so I represent the Bronx and Queens. I represent New York's 14th congressional district. So it's about East Bronx and uh, Western Queens. Here in, in our backyard and in our community, thankfully, um, things have been relatively okay. We have had hundreds, if not thousands of people hit the streets. And uh, we have been largely without um, you know, mass violence here here in my congressional district. We do have some parts of the Bronx that are hotspots, uh, Fordham Road, et cetera. Um, but overall, things are things are okay in the district. Um, but ultimately, you know, we know that this this whole thing came out um, as a crisis of accountability, and it will not end until we actually move through this by instituting accountability and actively setting up systems of justice. And um, yes, this is about policing. This is also about the fact that uh, that almost less than half men, half, half of black men right now are employed due to COVID-19, due to the mass unemployment epidemic. This is also because we're literally losing our family members, our mothers, our brothers and sisters, because the, the impact of COVID was racialized. Then we have mm -hmm. The brutality of police brutality on top, lighting a match of all of this kindling. So I just want to emphasize that the solutions here got to be systemic. It's not going to be a little crumb here and a little gesture there. This needs to be a wholesale restructuring of how we approach justice in America. Uh, let's go to Brooklyn District Attorney uh, Eric Gonzalez. Um, Tell us what it, I mean, other than being a district attorney, would love to know uh, what you're dealing with right now with um, protesters being summoned and arrested, um, as well as how you're handling that and what you feel about the current climate. Listen, I represent uh, all of Brooklyn, uh, largest county in New York State. Over two and a half million people live here in Brooklyn. I'm from Brooklyn, grew up here. Um, and what I'm witnessing reminds me a little bit of what we've seen in other times in Brooklyn's history, whether it was the blackout um, or Crown Heights uh, uh, protest. People are out there. They're angry. They have a right to be angry. Um, and we can't diminish what they're trying to accomplish by just saying there are a few bad apples in the crowd. The crowd is out there because of what happened. And it's important for me to say as the chief law enforcement officer in uh, Brooklyn that I denounced the killing. I think the officer is responsible. All of them should be held accountable and we should move forward. And when we talk about this accountability, we have to talk and I agree uh, with both Congress members. It's not sufficient just to take and prosecute a case. That's not going to create the systems change that people want for justice. We have to create legislation, change policies, and move the ball forward for our children and our next generation. This is not an isolated incident. This did not just happen. This is a continuous pattern of, of practices throughout the country. It's happened here in New York City, as Reverend Sharpton can you know, tell you in detail, from case to case, it's happened throughout the country. And unless we make system changes, it will continue to happen. And so I'm happy to be here. I'm into the uh, family and friends of Judge Floyd. Um, we are going to make the changes here that will prevent this from happening again. And we have to, that's what the commitment has to be. It's not sufficient just to prosecute the case. We have to make the changes. Now, now uh, uh, Reverend, before you dig in, um, and I'm gonna throw it to you next, Eric Gonzalez, do you believe or do you know whether or not in our NYPD, there are active white supremacists or Nazi organizations 
on the inside? I don't know, but I am I am curious and I am concerned about things that I've seen just even the other day. There was a, a, uh, a clip that came across my desk in another county where an officer was throwing out the white power sign. Um, there is That is not the first time that it has been said. That needs to be investigated. I do know that both the governor and the mayor have asked for systems, evaluations of the police department and other practices, but whether or not these are white supremacists or there are other things, there are things in our current policing structure that allow that to continue and happen and to be unchallenged. Um, so we know for a fact that- well, And what, what is that? What is that thing? Tell, tell the audience that thing that prevents that from being challenged. One of the things that happens is the policing contracts and the policing unions and the failure to actively discipline officers from day one. And then not having a sufficient um, and independent enough CCRB and other kind of independent commissions that actually have some tooth and teeth to it so that they can take action. They have to make recommendations to the police commissioner that may or may not happen. Um, we need to have an independent, truly independent commission that has some power. Um, but for the mayor and for the police commissioner, when officers do something that they think is actionable, does not fit in with their vision of what a New York City police officer should be, they should take action and fire them. By the time a case comes to a prosecutor and there's some act of violence, normally you, we see the person has had a lot of problems in their career, a lot of incidents of, of force, excessive force, or allegations of doing terrible things. Let me, let me pick and up. So, go ahead, Mr. Sharpton. Let me ask uh, the, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, and, and then I want to go to AOC. One, then why are we negotiating contracts with unions that would prohibit us from knowing whether someone has a membership with a white supremacist or Nazi group or has inclination for racism? How do we stop negotiating with these unions or at least identifying the elected officials that engage mm -hmm. in these kind of corrupt standings? And secondly, I want to ask you, if there was somebody tonight, if you were walking down the street and somebody threw somebody down, put their knee on their neck, had three homeboys standing with them, and the person died, wouldn't that alone be enough probable cause to arrest all four? And mm -hmm. why aren't we seeing mm -hmm. probable cause in the situation in uh and uh where we're dealing with the uh with the with the uh, Floyd case uh in Minnesota right now. All right. Well, listen, you know that uh Minneapolis how they govern there and what the decisions they make there are going to be out of you know out of my control. But what I would tell you is what I see here. Um this office does not um, do summary arrest. We do cases, we investigate cases, we send them to the grand jury. Um, and when we get an indictment, we authorize an arrest warrant that has an officer return um, back to court. And that is a structure that is problematic because the, the arresting agencies on these cases are the police office, the police department. And if they choose not to make an arrest, as they do in most cases involving officer-related um, claims, then the, DA, the option that DA has is to request an arrest, but normally requires them to go into the grand jury and secure an indictment first, which obviously um, would mean getting uh, the witnesses and the evidence together and doing the investigation. So it, it's a different system when the DA is authorizing an arrest and a summary arrest by, made by a police department uh, I would say, in general, one of the things I'm trying to do in, in terms of justice is to try to prevent summary arrest. Um, too many people are arrested, put through the system, and there's not sufficient evidence that they are responsible for the crime. So I understand the anger that they get treated differently, and that is a problem, but it's also a problem the way we conduct business in usual. We, we should not really be arresting people without making sure we have sufficient evidence they're responsible, and that's the right course. In Brooklyn, I will tell you, there's been acts of, of violence in this county. Um, I've, I've set up a tips hotline here in Brooklyn, tips at brooklynda.org. We've received them. 
and we have a number of cases under active investigation today. I'm sure we're going to talk more about that, but that's what I'm doing. I'm making sure that these things are not sitting because we do need swift and quick resolutions of these cases, which is something that we never get on police cases. Yeah, but we well, also and, need and, one standard. We need one standard. Police should not be above the law. They ought to enforce the law. But let me ask AOC my question. I go back to you, Ebro. Mm -hmm. In one thing that we did see uh, that they did, uh, that when I, when I got out there, uh, that was interesting to me, they fired the four policemen immediately. They're not prosecuted, but what well, if not charged, but one fired them immediately based on they saw the tape and you had a man, George Floyd, dead in New York, AOC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Eric Garner, Speak it took him five years to get him fired. Five years. And how much did he get paid? And all, all the way through that. So, what do we need to do? That we, I mean, we're talking about Minneapolis, New York operated worse with Eric Gardner. It mm -hmm. took five years to stress to that family to get him fired. They never prosecuted him. How do we correct that? Yeah. AOC? And you know what, Rev? It's not, it's beyond that, too. Even you look at the immediate events of the last three to four days, you saw that horrific video in Atlanta of those police officers that stopped. The, the these two young uh, black black kids, black students, they're actually college students. Mm -hmm. and one they, went to Morehouse, one went to Spelman. Yes, Morehouse right. Spelman students opened their door, tased them, terrorized them. The next day or within 48 hours, they were their badges were taken, they were fired, and there was account and and there was immediate account, immediate steps towards accountability. None of this- And as of, today, as of today, six of them have been charged. Exactly. Right. We are seeing immediate accountability in Atlanta. So we are we are seeing different models of leadership here. I'm just gonna I'm, say straight up, different uh, models of leadership and different models of accountability. And, uh, and that's the thing. If we are going to say, because here, here's the thing that I think is, is really important to communicate. If the, if the law is important, we need to uphold everybody to that law. Because if we see an officer running SUVs over human beings, flashing white power signs, throwing young women to the street, pulling masks down from young boys so that they can pepper spray them in the mouth, and we do nothing, what that is just as responsible and just as much a contribution to the chaos that we are seeing in the streets and the anger that is breaking windows than anything else as well. And so we need that. People need to see that one law applies to all people equally in order to start quelling these tensions. Um, let's go to Eric Adams, um, who just jumped on Brooklyn Borough President. Um, Eric Adams, um, I'd, I'd love to tell uh, you to tell people uh, beyond being Brooklyn Borough president, um, yeah. how you feel about the current state of things and what you're seeing on the ground in Brooklyn. I can't hear you. I'm not sure if you can hear me, but I can't hear you. We can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. But he cannot hear you. <laughs> Well, so we got, tell, tell Eric Adams, we'll come back to him. Back over to you, um, Nidia Velasquez. Um, I would love to ask you about a term I recently learned called qualified immunity. Qualified immunity is a federal statute that uh, protects public officials while on the job. It's a legal doctrine in the United States federal law that shields government officials from being sued for discretionary actions performed within their official capacity unless their actions violate clearly established federal law or constitutional rights. And that's at a federal level. At a state level, uh, we have statute 50A, which I don't know if everybody on this conversation is familiar with. Um, you and I spoke briefly about 58 before we entered uh, into this town hall. I would love to hear what you think about these things that protect public officials uh, from being handled the same way citizens, regular everyday citizens, 
would be handled if they made flaws on the job, failed to complete their job, or worse, murdered someone. So I, I believe that, look, yesterday in Louis, uh, Louisville, the police chief was fired after a black man, David McKee, was shot by police. And so it, because, and because it revealed also that the body cameras were not operating. So this is the first time that I can remember there being real accountability when body cams were not functioning. And so what I'm trying to say is that despite the despair, the anger, the pain that we are going through, uh, things are changing, not as fast as we wish, but what I think is that we need to seize this moment. So the judiciary chairman, uh, Jerry Nadler, he got work to do in uh, revisiting this type of statute. It shouldn't be elected officials, public officials, police officers. We have to be held to a higher standard. And so those type of statutes should be repealed, if not modified. But my position is that no protection should be granted to any public official who has committed a crime, who has committed any type of uh, illeg illegal activity. And so I support repealing uh, this 58 uh, statue in New York State. I believe that the, pre uh, the governor today said that he wants to get rid of it. Well, this is the moment. The public, the people in this country, they are waiting for actions. And uh, um, Brooklyn Borough President Eric Gonzalez, can you articulate to us uh, the spe specifics of Statute 58? Because I'm sure you've had to understand that in your job. And, and you so, Brooklyn DA. I mean, Brooklyn DA, excuse me. Brooklyn DA, excuse me. So 50A is a statute that protects uh, personnel records and other information that's being kept on uh, you know, police officers. Um, you know, I, for a, a while now, um, since my campaign, said that we should uh, abolish 50A or at least modify it so that while an officer's personal information like their home address or things can be protected, that the underlying issues in involved in their personnel record would be made available. Uh, I became the first DA in New York City to release a list of officers that because of their prior, um, what we've seen, what we deemed in the office bad acts that we would not prosecute their cases. And 50A was a barrier to doing that and to releasing more information about disciplinary actions of an officer. So a lot of officers have been sued uh, you know, a number of times. Uh, they've had been found uh, responsible either in departmental trials or other information, and that those bad acts are not made known. Um, and that's been a problem for accountability. Uh, and so those things would be uh, amended or repealed by getting rid of 50A and just allowing them to protect certain private information like their, you know, their home address. Uh, that is something that I signed a letter of support very recently, a couple of days ago, um, I think in the beginning, end of May, but something that consistently that this office has been uh, advocating for. The public has a right to know that the officers um, who respond to them and whether you're accused of a crime or you're a victim of a the crime. The officers whom we pay. Yes. The and, officers whom we pay. And, and let me say this. If you're a victim of a crime and the officer has a terrible um, background, you can find yourself in a case where your case is compromised because the officer's background is so damaging that they can't serve as a witness in your case. So this not only protects people accused of crimes, but it also protects victims and witnesses of crime. Who's, when we've had cases that we will not prosecute because we do not believe we can put that officer on the stand. And so that's one of the reasons why 50A is important to repeal. It protects everyone in the system, all players in the system. Well, um, let me, bro, let me bro, what? what why don't we ask Brooklyn Borough President, can you hear us now, Eric Adams? Yes, I can. Thank you. You used to be a policeman. 
uh, when I met you, you were one from the inside trying to reform uh, the police department and, and ran into a lot of problems in doing so. What would be any rationale that 50A should continue to exist when we find policemen that have a pattern of abuse and those that are the victims don't have access to that information to know that this is something this officer has done before. Yet, if if any civilian is arrested, we all of our records are available. And we've even seen in this city with some former mayors that brought public their juvenile records that had been sealed. Uh, there, there, there is no rationale, uh, Rev, and to our guests, uh, there is, an, as uh, the district attorney stated, uh, you know, you the balance of not releasing uh, personal data and personal information because it is a safety issue uh, is the only thing uh, that I would support not releasing. But talking about the, the action of that officer in his career and the number of CCRBs and other items uh, it should be publicly known. And I think that's very important. Um, also, uh, Eric Adams, um, you jumped on late. We appreciate you taking out the time today. Um, I would love to hear from you um, on what you are seeing on the ground in Brooklyn right now with the protests and what you would like to communicate to everybody tuned in um, with regard to the energy in Brooklyn and, and, and what you want the borough to know moving forward. You know, this is my life work. Uh, I think there's no lack of clarity of that. Uh, Reverend, as Reverend Sharpton faded, you know, being arrested as a child, beat bad by police. When I saw uh, that Mr. Floyd was on the ground and that officer had his knee on his neck, I relived the beating I had in the 103rd precinct, uh, my brother and I. And I did not want to be a cop. Uh, the activists of the day, they encouraged me to go in and start 100 Blacks in law enforcement in 22 years of my life have been fighting this. And so I'm, I, I am invested. But I too come from the spirit and energy of what Dr. Uh, Dr. King and uh, Reverend Sharpton came from. I believe in nonviolent protest. And I know that there is a body in this city that's attempting to hijack the righteous fight that our young people are participating in. They're well-trained. Their desire is not to end uh, police abuse. Their desire is to see our city up in flame. And I've been speaking to some of the organizers on the ground to help them identify who they are, move them out of, of this righteous protest so that we can stay focused on what we are attempting to do. Uh, Reverend Sharp, there and I recall um, how during the high crime areas in many of our cities and this city was gutted and buildings were gutted. We fought to turn around this city. We can't watch the city burn again. And I'm just encouraged. Every night I'm out there with the protesters talking to our young people, letting them know that you can fight this righteous fight the same way Nelson Mandela did, the same way Dr. King did, the same way we had a lot of changes. And I think we really insult their legacies when we state there's not been any changes. That's not true. Uh, we've made major changes because of what we've done and we have to continue those changes. We've come a long way and we have a long way to go and we have to be consistent in the process of doing so. I think, I think the reason that comes up is because we're having the same conversation I'm sure many of you have had many times throughout your life's work. And the question I have for all of us here, because I think at some regard, we have all fallen short because there is still acceptable white supremacy and racism and Nazi networks working inside the police department. And that piece, not only politicians and district attorneys and prosecutors who keep going up the ladder, but police, and we can't get to them. So we've fallen short. All the work that's been done, but we're still talking about police contracts. We still can't even, we can't get to their pensions. I trust, trust, not firing. When you commit a crime as a police officer and your pension is paying your legal fees, you'll be thinking twice about how you behave on that police force. That's why that sentiment is out there, is because at this point, I can't give any police officer 
unless you're actively pointing out bad cops, mm. actively, and pointing out Nazis and white supremacists who want to do harm to black men specifically and people of color generally, you are not a good cop because you do hopscotch and play basketball and do double dutch in Harlem. I'm tired. Of those videos got to stop. But let me stop. Let me share this, Ebro, because you make you raise you raise a good point. But let me let me tell you how we change the police department and get the cops that you're talking about in there. Uh, we tell our young men and women of get, join the police force. You, you see police chief like Chief Madry, and he's not just playing hopscotch. What he's doing around anti-violent violence and how he partners uh, with the cure violence groups in our community. You got young brother Raymond. Uh, that brother went in and sued the police department because of what they were doing. A good soldier uh, in the police department, uh, uh, Cap Captain St. Fort, and what he's doing about proactively going in to grab young people who are caught with gun collars and instead of trying to put them in jail, finding out why they had that gun in the first place and give them the services they need. So we need strong black men and women to go into our law enforcement agencies and reform the concept of law enforcement and stop using it as a tool of oppression, but as a tool to help communities like they help other communities. So by doing our own recruitment, putting them through our own pre-academy. Before you go in the academy, you're going to sit down and get your assignment like those leaders did for me when Randolph Evans was shot and killed. They sat the 13 of us down and said, here's your assignment when you become a police officer. And we continue to tell young people not to become cops, not to become uh, 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 FBI agents, not to become Secret Service, that you're not going to have the Black, the Latinos, the Asians, the others who can go in and change the organization from, from within. I didn't want to be a cop. I was given my direction by those who were civil rights leaders, and they said, you're going to spend the entire day of your career reversing what we saw in that department, and I gave every year of my career <clears throat> to that. Yeah, but but let me pick up on that. I think that there are good cops that do some good things, but I think the basis of what Ebro was asking, I don't see enough of, and that is enforcing the law against bad cops. It's not enough just to engage for President Adams in good stuff, but if you've got a cop that drives a SUV into a crowd over a barricade, if you've got a cop as we had in this city with Abner Lewima, where he was taken into a precinct and was uh, raped with a broomstick, 200 cops in the building and none of them stopped them and none of them turned them in. I don't care what good they do in the community. Their job is to enforce the law and they need to arrest and turn in their fellow officers. If you're a member of a criminal organization, which a white supremacist group is and a Nazi group is, you need to turn them in. You can be the greatest guy in the world in the community, but if you take that badge, you need to enforce the law even against other guys that are in the police department. Well, and, and the reason I'm and the reason I'm setting that tone for everybody uh, tuning in right now, the Hot Nine Seven and WBLS, is because when it's not fixed, we get what we got right now. That's right. Because these young people that we are seeing in the street, mostly we're seeing positivity and people following the right process of peacefully protesting. That is what we're mostly seeing. But unfortunately, we're also seeing young people who are willing to get shot by police to make sure their energy is felt. We are seeing young people willing to go to war right now. And that's why I say we have fallen short. That's right. Mm -hmm. Because right now we have lost the grace period. We are all of that, you know, justice will be served and the proper procedure. And we lost that, man. All of the non convictions throughout, and the fact that the Eric Garner thing took five years. 
Mm. I can't in good faith get up here and sit with y'all and act like, yeah, no, no, we're going to figure it out. When? It's too late. Mm. My grandmother, my great grandmother, my father, it's mm. generational. Mm. We have mm. lost the grace period, guys. Mm. And, and, as, and as we wrap this segment, of the conversation tonight. That's what I want to send you all away with understanding. And Eric, I know you're on the ground. You see it. But the patience is gone. Uh, Nidia, uh, Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez, I see you want to say something. Yes, I, I, I believe that there has to be a national strategy to deal with this. And we need to not only uh, send a message to police officers, who engage in crimes uh, that they need to know that they will be arrested and prosecuted, period. But also, we need to tie um, the fact that the police departments, whether it's New York City or uh, Chicago, every place else, then if they get federal resources, that those federal resources will be tied to how they are performing regarding police brutality, that we need to also stop militarizing the police department and the federal government has a role to play on that. So there are different things that we need to do so that they will come together for even that mayor or that police department chief to know that there will be consequences, that that code, the blue code, uh, has to be something of the past going forward. And I think that's what you saw. Um, don't underestimate. Go the ahead. Go ahead, Brooker, Brooker. I think that's what, we, what you saw. Don't under, underestimate the significance of what happened in uh, Minnesota. All those officers should be arrested, but there were several significant things that we fought for that finally you saw materialized on a, a level. Number one, uh, the message was clear. If a person commits a robbery and other people are standing there around, they are arrested for acting in concert. All of those officers, the officer that did the initial uh, knee in and the officers who were there were also uh, arrested or uh, uh, fired immediately one was arrested, the rest should be indicted, but it sent a message to the police agencies, you are now responsible not only for your individual actions, but the actions of people when you are there and you do not step in. That was not a message that was ever sent in police before you're seeing that. Now match with that, you need to be told you're gonna to be treated like any other person that commits a crime. You're gonna be charged with acting in concert because you did not stop the crime from taking place in the first place. That's the next way that we need to make sure happen. But it was very significant and we can't wait five years. Um, what we did here in, this new, in New York City and continue to do, we hid behind the federal government doing their investigations, so we waited too long. No, the call is now. You need to immediately take action. The evidence is there. And then those who are involved, even the person who's not the direct involvement, if you're there, just the same way we treat someone acting in concert, we need to treat the people who were there and did stop the crime. Well, and, and on that, and let me add that, because I'm sure everybody on here has at some point had interactions with police or police unions that had made you feel intimidated. Um, I would love for the audience, because in the streets, we call the NYPD the biggest gang in New York. And whenever you speak out against them, you feel like, I mean, historically speaking, it's well documented, but even in present day, uh, law enforcement moves like a gang when anyone is moving against them. Um, they moved against de Blasio. They even put his daughter's information out the other day when he, when, uh, she was arrested on the, uh, Sergeant's Benevolence Association Twitter. Mm -hmm. Um, these, these individuals move around like a gang because they're protected. And now we can start with, um, AOC, cause I know you have a story. But anyone else, um, hopefully I don't have to call you out and ask you, but have you experienced police bullying in your job? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, first of all, 
just straight up, the answer is is yes. Just two days ago, former commissioner called me an anarchist on Twitter uh, for talking about basic issues, talking about basic accountability. Um, but also, you know, I think on a federal level, on a federal, level, and I think it's not just about lobbying complaints and just you know, airing our grievances, but we need to talk about the actual solutions. But on a federal level, one thing that a lot of people don't know is that the largest law enforcement agency in the United States of America is CBP, Customs and Border Patrol. That is the largest law enforcement agency in the United States. And I told you, I was telling you this before, Ebro, um, and it, it, it mirrors a lot of issues. CBP has even less accountability than uh, state and municipal police departments, but they, you look in the streets right now in Miami and in, um, and in DC, they are now bringing in, Trump is now bringing in CBP as backup for the tear gassing and for the attacking of peaceful protesters that we're seeing, particularly in DC, uh, to clear the way for a photo op. And, uh, and I, you know, I'll tell you before the call, I, have had a lot of death threats lobbed at me by white supremacists. I've been targeted by the president. I have never been more scared in my in my entire tenure as a member of Congress than when I was in a CBP facility where there were officers circulating photoshopped images of violence towards me, sexual violence towards me. Uh, when I was in the facility itself, they stripped me of my phone and they said there are no phones allowed at this facility. We went inside and then there were just officers filming me a uh, low level while their superiors looked on. Um, I was more scared of CBP officers than I was of the immigrants that they were detaining. I went in those rooms and that at a very deep level is a culture issue. And that culture issue comes and stems from a, a policy place stature of immunity and of impunity. The idea that I can do whatever I want and I will not be held accountable quickly spirals into a very depraved and dehumanizing place. And I think it's very important that we talk about that because that's where these policy solutions come into play. That's where we talk about 50A, when we talk about transparency, when we talk about repealing or, or really making systemic changes to qualified immunity. It comes from, from a, that is why it's important because it hits at the culture. You know, you don't flash a white supremacist sign in the street with a badge on unless you have a feeling of impunity. You don't go on, on the air, on the radio and tell people you know, to shoot the MFers, or, you know, this, this is, it, it tears- Or run them over. Fat fabric, or run them over on, on public radio. It tears at the social fabric. It comes from a place of sensing immunity because the policy and the law grants immunity and a lack of accountability. So at the core, that's why we need to be very focused on this. That's what gets at the culture. This is not about blame. This is not even talking about individuals. This is about talking about policies and systems. And it can feel very personal. I understand. I know a lot of people say, well, you don't understand what it's like. I, you know, I have members in my family on both sides. I have members of my family that have been police officers. I have members of my family that have been shot at and incarcerated and stabbed. And so, uh, you know, it, it, when you when you are in the middle of that, you learn that it's this whole system that is not serving anybody that is producing violence. And so when we that is why we have to focus on these policy changes. And aside from folks who are actively engaged in crime, whether you have a badge on or not, aside from from actually holding crime to account, this is not about finding out who's a good apple or a bad apple. It's about making sure policies are in place that protect everybody, everybody from violence and social instability and abuse of power and being abused by power. Um, I know we are uh, have we have limited time. Um, there's a couple of questions that have come come up. Um, um, there's a couple of questions about mental health and police officers mm -hmm. and vetting police officers. Mm -hmm. Um, I will go to you, Eric Adams, because you were a police officer. Um, is there anything that we can do as a city to put more pressure on the institution of 
policing to be more actively involved in mental health evaluations uh, with these officers. Uh, and so true. And I think the Congresswoman said something that's significant and, and that is the entire system. We fought during those days of dealing with uh, the applicant process and uh, aspect of policing, how the examination of mental health was really a test that didn't really focus on racism, didn't focus on uh, some of those tendencies that could impact us when we're doing this uh, very challenging job. And we need to continue to revamp uh, not only how we recruit officers, but what assignments they do. Because, and I say this often, because you are in a career doesn't mean you can do every assignment in the career. You know, there's a reason you have doctors that are emergency room doctors and that are surgeons. Policing is the only occupation where you believe that the mere fact you have the basic abilities of do law enforcement, that you could do every job in that career. And then you are, many people are on the front line too long that deals with PTSD. If every interaction you have with the public is the negative interaction, you have the tendency to believe the public is negative in every aspect of it. And we don't deal with the mental stability of people identifying when they should not be on the department. We take too long to address that. We become a safe haven for dysfunctionalities in our law enforcement throughout the country. And Ebros, if I can say before I uh, conclude, I gotta thank uh, KISS and WBLS, uh, Fatim, yourself, uh, uh, Reverend Sharpton. This station has given information and empowered- Well, Hot 97, Hot 97. Hot 97. KISS FM's family too. We don't want, they're not on the air anymore. One day they're gonna be back. Well, that's know, a different conversation about yeah, advertisers and, and ratings. We'll get into that. So important, the information that has been um, handed out, not only on Sundays, uh, but throughout the weeks. And I really want to, I, I don't want to conclude without acknowledging um, what the stations have been doing. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Um, hey, but bro, it's our, it's, it's our honor to be able to serve the community. Go ahead, uh, Eric Gonzalez. I, I think I agree tremendously with what our borough president has said. Um, so many of our officers are dealing with PTSD and dealing with other trauma not unlike the trauma that's in our communities um, in general. We have to change what the focus of our justice system is. It's too predicated on sanctions and punishment and not on community well-being. And bringing people into our criminal justice system and giving them services and making sure that we're preventing bad behavior as opposed to simply trying to punish people. Uh, we have to redefine what justice looks like and what the goals of our criminal justice system that will change a lot of the interactions that we have on, on the streets between police officers and civilians. Uh, and, and Who we changes just, that? Who ch who's responsible for changing that? Listen, I became a prosecutor for the same reason Eric became a cop. I wanted to start seeing people like me in the courtroom because when I was growing up, I didn't see anyone like me in our, in our Brooklyn DA's office or in our courthouse. So you have to become the change you want. So I agree with our borough president that we have to continue to recruit. We have to continue to fight. And we're changing the, the conversations. You know, uh, Congress member uh, Casio cortez and, and, and Nidia Velasquez um, have been on the forefront of changing the conversation about what justice looks like and that's what we have to continue to do um congresswoman uh nidia velasquez and aoc thank you for your time today i want to leave you guys just um can we all agree that identifying bad police officers and white supremacy and racism in our political offices and in our police office and in our police precincts is a paramount issue mm -hmm. Without a doubt. hundred percent. And we can, and everybody here in our voices right now or watching this on Facebook or wherever it's streaming on YouTube can count on you guys to continue to beat this drum moving forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's not, a, it's not a moment, it's a career. This is my life. Well, good, because I'm going to be saying your names a lot if things ain't going right. Just know that. <laughs> loud, loud. <laughs> <laughs> it's going... You're going to be, I might start taking out billboards, man. <laughs> it might have to happen. Thank Reverend, you, thank you for Reverend, your be safe out there in Minneapolis. <laughs> I'm worried about being safe in New York. Mm -hmm. <laughs> safe out here too, but we wish you.
a lot of a lot of safety, but we we love you, Rev. Just so you know that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you guys for your time. Uh, we're going to be moving on to the next panel in a few minutes. Uh, Reverend Sergeant, before we move on to the next panel, just me and you. Um, you know, how are you feeling about Bill de Blasio's handling of the current state of the city right now? I think New that, I think that uh, at one hand, I've, I've worked and, and supported him on some things, but I think that he is challenged here. Uh, I think that there was uh, clearly uh, a not thought out plan and how to deal with the uh, demonstrations that came here. I think that the way that uh, the police, such as the van going into the crowd, such as this us against them attitude, uh, did not speak well of, of the city. And uh, for one that had uh, champion stop and frisk to now at this stage in his mayoralty to have this kind of challenge and this kind of distrust, I think is something that uh, we just should not have expected, and we should not. Is this celebrate. Dermot? Is this the new uh, Chief Dermot Shays tone? I don't know. It uh, felt uh, like I, for a little while when Jimmy O was in there, things were things were chill. Now he didn't deal with something like this, but you know, I don't. I'm trying I, don't to evaluate. Know if, I don't know if it's Shay, but I know that it, that on the streets, I'm talking to people. Uh, you know, I came back from Minneapolis. Talking to a lot of people, a lot of people in Nan out there marching, Nash Action Network. And and people feel that New York City Police Department in it in and of itself is not right. I think that the department lost a lot of credibility in that five year stretch on Eric Garner. And I think what happened with Floyd reminded us how egregious and despicable it was that they would not prosecute the policemen or even fire them that did that to Eric Garner. Um, before the rest of the, the next panel comes in, um, let's talk COVID-19. Uh, you have been raising money, PPE. You've been out there giving out masks. Um, obviously, just like anything else in America, coronavirus showed up in America and it's racist. And, you know, that's because of the institutionalized racism that takes place here. Uh, and is is a part of the fabric of the United States of America. Um, a hundred thousand people have died. Most of them are black and brown. Um, a lot of the essential workers in the country um, are black and brown. Um, we're doing that heavy lifting. And meanwhile, white America and even elite rich white America, uh, you know, isn't seeing uh, the death that the rest of the nation is. Obviously, access to health care and these other things. Um, what should we be telling the people right now uh, as we move forward on um, dealing with COVID-19 right now and in the winter and seasons to come? I think that we've got to tell people, one, that this is very serious. I think that we've got to demand a restructuring of how we do health services in this city. Uh, it is no accident. It is not genetic that we are dying at larger uh, numbers that we've found positive in larger numbers, and we can't just keep wishing our way through this. There are structural differences in how black and brown people in this city get health care and, and others. And I think that we need to address the infrastructure of health services in this city and state, just like we are doing policing, because we're talking about our very lives. And the fact that people want to rush people back to work, essential services that are disproportionately us when we are not sure that they've even got a health environment to do that, I think in and of itself is biased. I think that we should not force the city and state open until we force everything uh, that the elite have open. I told the people in Washington they should open up when they open up the White House for tourists. And then I will believe that it's safe but it seems that they're very selective in who they want to risk. Um, on that note, um, I think we should uh, bring in Congresswoman Yvette Clark out of Brooklyn. We have Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz Jr., Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, and Queens District Attorney Melinda Katz for the next portion of our town hall on uh, police brutality and COVID-19. Um, I think uh, so far we have Yvette Clark, Congresswoman. How are you? Good evening. 
Good evening, Ebro. Good evening, Reverend. Great to be with Good you. Evening. Good evening. Um, before before we get over to Hakeem Jeffries and the rest of the panel, I want to give you time to tell uh, the people tuned in, wherever they are, uh, what it is, uh, what area of New York City you represent, and at what level, and uh, and how you see things happening, and what the tone is, and your experience dealing with these uh, current protests. Yes, I, I represent the Ninth District of New York, and that is uh, Central and South Brooklyn. Starts at the Barclays Center. And runs all the way out to Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn. That's north south. So it's from Atlantic to the Atlantic. And on uh, my west side, I represent Park Slope. On my east side, I represent Brownsville. Extremely diverse constituency. This is where I was born and raised and have lived most of my life. It's my hometown. Uh, and that's I on the federal level. That's on the federal level um, in the House of Representatives. And uh, right now we're, we're focused on the fact that people are in these streets and our district has been ground zero for a lot of the mobilization and protests that have been taking place in Brooklyn. And I say, you know, let's do this. Let's, you know, let's make sure that we express our outrage, our anger, our disappointment, and let's get some demands. Let's organize, let's make sure that all of this is not in vain. People are risking their lives to protest. As Reverend Al has just stated, COVID-19 is not over with us. And I'd say that people are really putting their lives on the line right now to, to make a difference. And we've got we've to deliver. Um, with that, um, I think it goes without saying that um, overwhelming, well, maybe we should say, because I'm watching the news and it looks like they're trying to spin it to everything as a, a looting and, and violent. Um, from the from the protesters, but from what I've seen and heard, overwhelming majority of protesters um, and protesting has been positive. Correct, Congresswoman, absolutely. you were out there. It's ab absolutely. I, I agree one hundred percent. You know, there are those bad actors that are you know taking advantage to uh, to loot and to destroy property and and you know to to escalate things. Um, that's not the vision of the protest. The vision of the protest is to come out with demands that they make of us, those of us in political office, and our job is to receive those demands and move forward. We've got the people behind us. There's no reason why we can't make a change. We can't transition out of this disgraceful um, you know, a, a police dynamic that we've had to live under for, for all these years. Have you ever seen this much uh, outpour in your time, either living in and around New York City, about specifically police brutality and the, a shift in the culture of policing? Have you ever seen this before? I have seen it before, unfortunately. You know, I grew up here in central Brooklyn in the 60s and 70s when I was a young kid. You know, the police department right here in, in my district gunned down a young boy, 15 years old, black brother, Randolph Evans. Um, right. And, you know, I came out in the streets at, at, at age 11. So, you know, we can, we can go down the litany. Reverend led a lot of our protests uh, right here in central Brooklyn. So, you know, this is something that, that we're, we're aware of. There's a new element to this in that there's another generation that's not taking it, that's out there in these streets. And, you know, us putting all of our forces together, I believe this is the time. We need to make this difference. We make we need to make this shift. We need to transition out of this Occupy um, force uh, dynamic that we've been forced to live under. And this is the this is the time to do it. Um, bringing in um, Congressman uh, Hakeem Jeffries, um, who you are also from Brooklyn, correct, sir? Uh, that's right. I represent the neighboring uh, district uh, that's adjacent to Yvette District. That's my sister. That's um, my brother. And, and so with what um, Congresswoman just spoke on is we have seen this before. We have been here before. For the young people tuned in, they're thinking, why do we keep falling short on eradicating this abusive behavior in our police department? because ultimately that falls on all of us on this panel right now. Why are we still having A, 
white supremacy and 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 a KKK Nazi type behavior uh, woven into the police dynamic and the police fabric of New York City? Why are we not able to effectively hold police accountable so that they understand that this stuff will not be tolerated? What is the issue, Hakeem Jeffries? Well, Ebro, thanks for convening us. Good to be with you, uh, Reverend Sharpton, all my colleagues in government. I think first and foremost, while we've come a long way in America, we still have a long way to go. And the fundamental reality is that racism has been in the soil of this country since the beginning, 401 years ago, uh, when those African slaves were first brought to this country. And we're still dealing with the legacy of slavery to this very moment. And so racism is in the soil uh, of this country. And we've seen often, decade after decade after decade, that police departments uh, have historically been used to suppress African-Americans and others. That was certainly the case uh, in the Jim Crow South. So we're dealing with that legacy uh, as well. We also have a problem from the standpoint of police accountability. Because as long as you have a situation where in case after case, uh, whether that is here in New York City, Amadou Diallo, uh, 41, 42 shots, four officers tried, every single one acquitted. Sean Bell, 50 shots, five officers tried, every single one acquitted. Same thing with Eric Garner, grand jury lets off Pantaleo and he stays on the force in fact, making overtime for five years uh, before he is uh, even disciplined in any way, but he's let off criminally. Uh, and so the absence of accountability, I believe, has resulted in a situation where for, for abusive officers on the force, and there are abusive ones and there are good ones, but for the abusive officers on the force, they and sent the signal that even if they cross the line, it doesn't matter because there will be no consequences. And so it perpetuates itself. That's why at the congressional level, we've been focused on making sure that we change those dynamics so that when an officer crosses the line, engages in violence, brutality, or abuse, there are consequences <laughs> in terms of on the job discipline and when necessary, criminal consequences to the full extent of the law. Until that changes, nothing will change. And what's standing in the way of you? What is the name of the policy that you're working on? And what is standing in the way of actually getting it done? Because I'm sure you and Congresswoman Yvette Clark are working on the same thing. Yeah, so we're working on a variety of different things. One of the things that we think needs to happen is that um, traditionally, district attorneys throughout the country have been reluctant to hold police officers accountable because they work with those police officers each and every day in the context of the criminal justice system. And so when we've seen accountability, Rodney King, second trial in the killing of Anthony Baez by Francis Lavodi with a chokehold in the Bronx in 1994, if you can believe it, mm -hmm. there was accountability on the second trial. Abner Louima, who was brutalized by the police uh, in the bathroom of a station house in Yvette Clark's district in the 90s. That was a federal prosecution uh, led by Loretta Lynch and the late great Ken Thompson when they were at the Eastern District of New York. When we've seen accountability the few times it exists, it's always been at the federal level. And so what we're saying is that we need to expand the jurisdiction for the U.S. Uh, Department of Justice Office of Civil Rights so that they can prosecute these cases every single time violence occurs. And that's one of the things that needs to happen. Uh, we need to outlaw procedures like the chokehold or a knee to the neck, make it unlawful under our nation's civil rights laws. I have legislation that Yvette Clark has been working hard on as well uh, that will be part of our congressional response. Uh, we need to also make sure that we have a national registry of abusive officers who are fired. Because what we've seen over the years is that an officer will be fired for engaging in inappropriate behavior, and then they'll be hired by another police department somewhere else in a neighboring county or a neighboring state. 
and then in many cases have gone on to then kill somebody when these are individuals who don't deserve to be on the force. So, uh, well, we that's what we saw in the George Floyd case. In the George Floyd, he had 12 different things that are something he was involved in. And Amy Klobuchar, who's currently trying to be vice president, wasn't effective in making sure that she took uh, him to task. The absence of accountability has consistently been a problem. That's why we're focused on changing that. Have you stopped Amy in the hallways of Capitol Hill and said, hey, you F this one up? Because yeah, I expect y'all the next time y'all see her, because now that's public information. Hey, Amy, check this out. Mm. You play games and now somebody's dead on camera. I don't think you should be vice president. Go sit down. Um, Melinda, I want to come to you because you are a district attorney and our great borough of Queens. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, great Hakeem Jeffries, uh, the great borough of Queens. Um, Hakeem Jeffries has said the district attorneys oftentimes don't want to prosecute, prosecute police officers because y'all work together all the time. Those are your buddies. Is what he's saying a true statement? I don't think it's true. I think we look at every case individually. Uh, you know, it's our job to find justice every day. That's a prosecutor's job. Uh, you know, people uh, often ask me, you know, isn't it just about prosecution? But it's not. What other job in the world can you effectuate justice every single day? And it's why when I saw the George Floyd uh, video, um, we took to, to the airwaves and we took to the social media. Uh, and I looked at it and immediately said, all four should be uh, brought up on charges and indicted. Uh, it is remarkable to me that it's been so long and it still hasn't happened. And, you know, if you look at social media, we talk about the fact that, well, if they just indict the other three, who, by the way, it's a non-starter, that should happen. They stood there, they didn't help, they watched and they let it happen. But I do think that the accountability is something that, that we need to have there. But it's just the start. You know, I heard Eric Gonzalez talk about the fact that this is just the start. It's great that they're accountable, but we need to make sure we put policies in place and programs in place. And when police officers or anybody else, by the way, act in an illegal activity, that we do investigate and prosecute. And I'm gonna go one step further than some of uh, the speakers did today. I, I agree that everyone should be treated equally, but I will tell you, I believe the police should be held for a higher standard. They are the ones who, when they walk into a courtroom and they testify, they have their uniform on and their badges on, and they're given the credibility. They're given sort of a presumption of a credibility. And I do think it's important to understand that that happens. So when something goes wrong or there are police officers that are committing criminal activity, we need to hold, the, hold them, uh, I think, to a very high standard. Uh, you know, it's, it's it, 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 you watch George Floyd and clearly your heart breaks and many people who are listening tonight have been in this movement for decades uh, and their parents before them. Uh, and I have the same frustration. We're sitting here in the exact same spot that we were six years ago in the exact same spot we were years before that. I've been a district attorney for five months uh, and we are working in every way to make sure that at the root cause, we are dealing with the issue uh, and trying to make sure that there is more fairness and equity, but they should all be indicted. Melinda, I have, I have uh, yeah, yeah, questions bro. for you. Uh, yeah, really quick, I have two questions for her. Really quick, I'm gonna throw to you, Mr. Sharpton, really fast. Are you aware of any white supremacist activity or Nazi activity in the NYPD? I, I am not aware of it, but we see the same media reports that you do, and they should be investigated. And we should take into account officers' uh, mental state and everything that they do and say. The same way I'm taken into account, whether it's in my private life or whether it's on the job, uh, what I say matters and what I do matters and how I uh, present myself to people who expect justice from me, who from to people who expect that I'm going to have a fair and even hand. It all matters, and so I do. I'm not personally aware, but I think that whatever. Do you it believe is, it exists? I believe that you, believe you know, it's thirty-eight thousand people. You you know, you can't say no and you can't say yes. But I do think that it sh it should be investigated. I've seen the same media reports as you did, uh, and I'm sure they will be. But at the end of the day, this is about the root structure the root way that we deal with justice in this, in this state. Uh, and so look, in the County of Queens, we're doing our best to reverse a lot of things. We, are, we didn't make any arrests. We got two DATs on Saturday for protesting. I believe in the protesters' message. I believe that 
We need fairness uh, for George Floyd, and we need to make sure that we make the changes here. It shouldn't be for naught. We should make the changes across the country to make sure there's better fairness and equity all across the board uh, in the justice system. By the way, and it's not only the justice system when it comes to police, it's also the justice system when it comes to prosecuting, making sure that we're not automatically putting people of color through the system when they get arrested, making sure that there's mentors and all the cure violence groups that go along with this. We watched as protesters in Southeast Queens were asked to, to de-escalate by folks in our community that work every single day to de-escalate the violence. Over to you, Reverend Al Sharpton. Reverend, how are you? Uh, well, how are you? I wanted to follow up with uh, what she was saying and ask a question. But let me say this, people, because you had said that we haven't seen this before. I remember, and this is where Ruben Diaz Jr. there, and uh, I really kind of hooked in. When they shot Amadou Diallo, uh, 41 shots, mm -hmm. 19 hit him. And there's a Netflix uh, documentary out now on, on uh, Netflix called 41 Shots. We went in front of one police plaza every day and had civil disobedience laid down and it got up to where they were arresting 250 people a day. Even former Mayor Dinkins, Ebro, came and laid down with us, sat down with us in front of one police plaza and was arrested as a former mayor. So, yeah, we've seen that we're at the seventh day. We did that 13 straight days, and that's when they indicted the cops. But then they played the trick and moved it to Albany. We've seen with, with the Diallo movement. We've seen with Admiral Louima days of it. It just wasn't violence. And I think that a lot of people are saying that we've had movements longer that uh, was able to get something done. But now these kids are saying, we don't care. We'll risk our lives. None of it is permanent. And I, I'm throwing this to uh, uh, Borough President Diaz and uh, Congresswoman Yvette Clark. None of it is permanent until we change how the city and state deals with the unions. As long as when Melinda Katz is talking about uh, a higher standard for police, I agree with that because they keep talking about we're the only human, but humans don't get a badge and a gun and represent the state. Normal humans don't. If you take a badge and a gun, we expect you to be more than just the ordinary human reaction. You're still human, but you should be trained above that. But you're not normal. You're able to break the union's hold on the politicians that make them sign contracts that don't hold them accountable. Uh, uh, first of all, good evening uh, to everyone. Uh, Ebro, thank you for putting us all here together. Before I start my comments, I just want to say to all the Latinos who are tuned in or who will be tuned in, remember that if you dance to salsa, merengue, bomba, la plena, bachata, that you do so with African instruments. And the first time, and I say that because the first time that I was ever part of a protest was back in 1994 when Anthony Baez was choked by Francis Lavodi. Congressman Hakeem Jeffries uh, spoke on that. And he choked Anthony Baez simply because he and his brothers were playing football in front of their own house and the right. football hit the, the police officer's car. Then I went and I participated in protests when two young uh, cousins were killed in a hail of 28 bullets. Hilton Vega and Anthony Rosario Sharpton, you were also a part of that. Right. They were shot while they were handcuffed in their backs. This happened uh -huh. back in 1995. Then you have um, Amadou Diallo. Um, I was a young assembly member and I was the first on the scene and, and I was the first one to call for a federal investigation. Sharpton then uh, came in. And, and you're right. And we did all of these. The, the reason why I bring all of that, bring that up is because we're all in this together. But we did all of those protests without with, under the leadership of Reverend Sharpton, National Action Network, without a single brick, without a single bottle being thrown. And I remember every time, whether it was Sean Bell, I was there in Queens with Sean Bell. I was in Staten Island with Eric Gardner. Um, I was uh, marching with, with um, Abner, uh, uh, you know, for justice for Abner Louima. Every single time you either had the victim or the families of the of the deceased saying, if you're going to come and you're going to throw bottles and, 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 and um, uh, loot or whatever, then you're destroying the legacy of our loved ones. We don't want you here. And we appreciate the leadership. And, and you know what? We've made gains. Some people say, well, we've been doing this for so long. What are the gains? Well, guess what? When the police officers who killed Diallo 
uh, approached them on Wheeler Avenue in the Bronx, they were part of what was called the street crimes unit. Their model was uh -huh. we own the streets. And we, because of those protests, we had a total disbandment of the street crimes unit. We were right. able to, after Gardner, we were able to do away with stop and frisk in the way that it was being implemented on the previous administrations. Uh, and so, you know, the, the sentiments that we see out on the streets, they're merited, they're warranted. I'll go a step further. Um, George Floyd was murdered. Right. He was killed in broad daylight for all of the world to see. When we talk about how do we move on, how do we start? Um, and I want to answer your question about, you know, contracts and, and, and all of that. But the first thing that should happen is the police departments, whether in New York City or all over the country, this is an easy one for them to say that was wrong. This is an easy one for them to say we should not be policing like that. And every time that you see a police officer, a man and woman in uniform hug a protester, that's how you, when they show that empathy, that's when the temperature comes down. But if you have police officers out there with riot gear, cracking heads, that's where you have the problem. With regards to contracts, look, it depends on who's at City Hall. So I'm glad that Reverend Al is lay, laying down the foundation. So whoever is seeking to represent us as mayor of the city of New York come next year, this is something that we have to talk about. How is it that you're going to look into the police department or any other union and make sure that the membership is one that is not viewing certain communities in a certain way? For me, when I was a young assembly member, I remember having a car, my car with assembly plates. I'm 20, I was 20 something years old and they took my cousin and I out of the car. They, they put his face down, they patted, they, they looked at the car. They treated me like a common criminal because in their mind, they could never ever believe that a young Latino in, who's 20 something years old could possibly be an elected official. So we've made gains, but we're not, and you talk about white supremacy, hey, I understand that. I believe that it exists. Look, if we have one in the White House, there has to be some in the police mm -hmm. department. But, 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 mm -hmm. but, but don't, get, don't, get tw don't get it twisted. There are also black and Latino police officers who have this mentality that they have to police us in a certain way. So that has to change as well. It can't be blue against us or us against blue. It can't be like that. We have to have this conversation. We've been having it. We made long games. That's why today um, I was proud as the borough president uh, to be out there in Fordham Road. So Fordham Road was an isolated incident. It wasn't about a protest. It wasn't a march last night. This was a band of individuals who were calculated, who were strategic, who know what they're doing, who know how to open up gates. They have the equipment, they have the tools, and then they open up the gates and then they loot, and then other people come in and take advantage of that. And so I was proud to stand not only with the community, not only with young people, but when you talk about making progress with the first black district female attorney in the state of New York with Darcel Clark and the first black speaker of the New York State Assembly. And so they were talking about hearing protesters and hearing their constitutional right and their voices for change. But they were also talking about legislation. They were also talking about systemic racism in terms of funding for the healthcare system. We saw how it decimated our communities around COVID. They were, we were talking about with legislators who were all there about funding our educational system. All the things that I've been working so hard and we all been working so hard for my entire political career. Now was the time to not only address police misconduct, but also, and, and their contracts and the people in the department, whether they're white supremacists or others who treat us a certain way, but also to address all of the other areas that we've been shortchanged that, that add and, and become the ingredients for the pain, the suffering that is being manifested in these protests. You know, um, Ebro, yeah, it, it's important that following that up, it's important on this uh, WBLS Hot 97 Town Hall. You notice I put BLS first. That's <laughs> inspirational. <thing. laughs> All respect. It's supposed to be like that. It's supposed to be <laughs> like that. <laughs> but uh, let me say that one of the things that you got to understand is that it, it, the irony of it is, as we all are denouncing reckless violence, we were demonized for doing nonviolent yep. protests against 
police. I mean, let's not act like they were that they were in love with peaceful protests. So when we distinguish those that are doing the peaceful protests now, who are the overwhelming majority, it's not that a lot of these that are speaking uh, for these policemen will embrace them. They acted like we were the worst things that ever happened to the city. And like Ruben said, we never threw a brick. They don't want to be questioned. And it's like you said, Ebro, we paid them. We have the right to question them when they go over the line. Well, and here's and here's the dangerous thing in the space that we're in right now. I told you Everything that happens from this day forward, people will think it only happened because they scared politicians and police into responding. That's right. Because every peaceful protest, people feel like it was cool, but the other night we had the president in a bunker. <laughs> That's why they're listening. That's right. We have they shut down Manhattan. That's why they're listening. We have, and that's why on the last panel, and I'm gonna bring it up this one. That's where we fell short because I don't know how we put this back in the bag. Well, without I'll, I'll, moving I'll... swiftly, without moving swiftly to eradicate bad police officers, we have lost the confidence. And when I say we, I really mean y'all because I don't even work in politics. And I definitely don't work for the police. Most of them don't like me. But they you've lost the grace period. All of the work that I've done talking on the radio about police and we could come together and they're doing precision policing and stop and frisk and they've moved away from this. I feel like all of that's been lost in what is has been on camera. The inspector Craig Edelman. Uh, yeah. Officer Vincent DeAndrea, who threw that woman to the ground, and his inspector was right next to him. Um, you know, talking about pensions and police unions, and when we start making sure that these police officers have to use their pension to pay for their legal counsel, not the taxpayer. You did something wrong, it comes out of your money, right? Not ours. When these things happen, people will believe what we're saying right now. We've been talking for 90 minutes, and I got a feeling people are listening to us like, ah, oh, this is cool. I got a bunch of elected officials in Ebro trying to, all right, here we are again. But I would argue. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead uh, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 bro, listen, we, we can't. We, we can't lose this opportunity to do what we must do That's right. to, to dismantle this. At the end of the day, cynicism exists no matter what when it comes to politics. But those who are dedicated to the struggle, those who understand what time it is, must use this time to make the gains. You talked about the uh, PBA or the police unions and their contracts. But there are a lot of ways to deal with that. And I think that the state of New York has a Bill 50A, that need, uh, a, a regulation that needs to be repealed. You right. know, and, and, and I will do a resolution from the federal level. I will do, I will get my colleagues mobilized. The CBC is on the march around getting justice at this stage from our, for our communities and dismantling this brutality that has been with us generation after generation after generation. I think what's significant about uh, the House of Representatives is that we have the most diverse body in the history of the United States Congress. And our chairman is, is, is with us today in, 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 in this town hall, uh, but I think we can rely on everyone getting on board and understanding that if we don't make moves right now to pass a suite of legislation that ultimately gets at the heart of what has been happening in terms of police brutality in our communities, things like the Police Accountability Act, things like uh, the chokehold legislation that my brother Hakeem Jeffries has introduced, which is critically acclaimed on the Hill, 
things like making sure that there's a national registration of rogue officers, then the people deserve to be cynical about the work that we do. It, if I can add, it's also important, uh, and I agree with everything that Congresswoman Clark just laid out. Uh, and of course, uh, it's great to be on with Ruben and Melinda, uh, who I've worked closely with over the years and served with as a young assembly member with Ruben uh, in the New York State Legislature. And Ruben, I'm not sure where the time has gone. Uh, but what what is important uh, to add to what Ruben was talking about in terms of change, in the aftermath of Garner, yes, Pantaleo was not criminally prosecuted and that was a problem. But led by Reverend Sharpton, we actually changed the prosecutorial landscape in New York State uh, and pushed Governor Cuomo uh, to enact an executive order that took the ability to make decisions about whether to prosecute a rogue police officer who kills an innocent civilian out of the hands of the local district attorneys. There are good ones like Melinda and Eric Gonzalez and Darcel, and then there are challenging ones. Uh, and so what was done mm -hmm. is that there is now an executive order in place that if a police officer kills an unarmed civilian in New York state, the prosecutorial decision is made by the attorney general who happens to be a black woman named Letitia James. And that came directly out of the Garner case. And so progress has been made, but there's still a lot more that needs to happen. And the final thing that I'd mention in terms of national change is that too many officers have a warrior mentality. Right. And if you've got a warrior mentality, you are declaring war on the communities you police, primarily Black and Latino, bearing the brunt of that corrupt mindset. We need to move from a warrior mentality to a guardian mentality. And we need to and put the policies in place that enable that type of policing to occur. And I Over think to you, Melinda Katz. I think it's important that we don't minimize the effect that these protests all across the country erupted and I think that that has an amazing effect. I, I, I don't want to see the looting and I don't want to see any of the uh, violent activity that may come from all this minimize, number one, minimize the cause uh, that people should be held accountable for their actions, whether they're police officers or anyone else, elected officials, people anywhere. Um, and so it shouldn't minimize it. And so I like that the discussion is happening. Look, it's been, it's been years. But the discussion's happening. You have people coming out against uh, racism, biasness in all forms uh, across the country in all police departments, many for the first time. Uh, many people who know that from now on, eyes are going to be every single day on the police, how we deal with the justice system. But I have to agree with Congresswoman Clark. We have to seize the day. I mean, it's we're, even if we get the four indictments, we got the one, even if we get the other three who should be responsible because they were standing around, nobody helped, nobody, nobody did anything. We still have a long way to go. We are not in a place yet where people of color feel comfortable on the street. We're not in a place yet where we can give the benefit of the doubt ever. We're not in a place where we're figuring out programs and why it is, for instance, like Queens was so hit in the communities of color uh, with COVID. Uh, and, you know, look, we had a policy at first where we were supposed to uh, prosecute those uh, who were not social distancing and not wearing a mask. And, you know, the first day I made the decision, we're not doing it. I'm not doing it in Queens County. We are not prosecuting people for not social distancing because it's not happening in every neighborhood. And so we're not doing it. But I think you need more of that. And so, look, from my perspective, the world is watching. And we've, I know you've been here before. I know I've been here before. But we have to, at least step by step, give a little credit to the fact that a lot's happened, even with the looting you know, being used as an excuse by folks. Uh, a lot's been changing, and, and, and people are watching. And there's going to be a microscope. Well, and, 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 and I just want to say, the reason I'm so heavy-handed about it yep. is because the looting's happening, and because of what happened. Yes. No, no, wait, wait, wait. Can I challenge you on that? The, the, just, these, 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 this is out the bag because of 
The fact that Ruben, two or three times in the 90s, you had to deal with it. Al Sharpton, countless times, you've had to deal with it. Uh, 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 Congresswoman Yvette Clark, you've had to deal with it. We've watched our parents and our parents' parents. We ran that man into a bunker the other night. But can I push back a little bit on that, Ebro? And, and you make a legitimate point. When you say, oh, folks are going to say that the only reason why politicians and change is happening is because, um, you know, we looted. That's far from the truth. Let me tell you why. Oh. Last night, that wasn't a protest what happened for them. And like everybody else, we were all disheartened. I was heartbroken. I went at 830 in the morning with my shovel and my broom to go and help clean up. And what I saw, what the media is not talking about today, is that there were hundreds, not, not dozens, hundreds of young people who were protesting all over the city who had come from the Bronx of color, who still came out Remember with him? their brooms with their garbage bags because they did not like what they saw last night. So I was saying Nobody there, likes it. Nobody I, likes it. Nobody likes to loot it. And no and, but but that but that but that right there dilutes what happened yesterday. What it does is it, it dilutes the message. It puts a it puts a, a, a hurt on our quest for justice. And what really really scares politicians and businesses is when you have so many doing the responsible protesting with such a diversity. So for me, I'm optimistic that more so than in years past, we see so many non-Black, non-Latino young people who are protesting along with us, who don't understand what we go through, but are empathizing with us in the same present. And if we talk about systemic racism, racism is a mindset. You could only legislate when somebody acts on that and the enforcement of racism. Racism is taught. So if I'm seeing so much diversity now, I think it goes a long way that these young boy, young men and women who are college students, who will be parents, they'll teach their children differently. And if they're going to be the future professionals and doctors and corporate execs and, and, and prosecutors, what, what, what they're marching today will lead us to a point where the mindset of hate, the heart, the dark heart of, of racism and bigotry will be past us. We're going to deal with all of the other issues and we have to deal with all the issues with funding and resources and everything. But what really scares folks is not the looting, but the masses of a diverse protest of crowd, because now we know that America is changing and we see it on the streets every day. But Ruben, let me say this, and, and I agree with uh, Ebro that nobody likes the looting, but the other problem that you have, the politics of it, is when Ebro talks about we ran the man in the bunker, he will come out that bunker and win if we play into his hands. And the fact of the matter is, when, when I was 13 years old, I became youth director of Operation Breadbasket, Dr. King's group in New York. Yvette remembers when uh, we had Breadbasket in Brooklyn. And yeah. I was coming out of Brooklyn, born and raised there. I never was in the South, but he had a division there. Dr. King was killed that same year. We rioted, we burned down 100 cities of Martin Luther King being killed. And a guy who had lost for president, lost for governor of California, came and ran that year on law and order. I will lock the country down and protect y'all. And he won on that. His name was Richard Nixon. We cannot play in the law and order Donald Trump. That's what he came out and said last night. It's about law and order. And the longer we see the looting, the more he is going to convince them I'll take the military and protect y'all, and he'll be reelected. But we've got to be. Now, that, was, that right there, that piece right there. If anybody takes anything out of this combo today, that jewelry right there is because the scene of that White House with the lights off was theatrics. Mm -hmm. It was a trap. All of this is theatrics. He's a TV guy. Right. And so we can't fall for the traps. The looting, it's a trap. Right. The violence, it's a trap. It's a trap. And with that, guys, I know we're over our time. Uh, Congresswoman Yvette Clark, thank you so much. Congressman Hakeem Jeffrey, thank you, sir. Uh, Brooke, uh, Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz, thank you so much. 
and Queens District Attorney Melinda Katz, thank you so much for your time tonight, guys. Thank you so much. And our eyes are on y'all. Absolutely. Have a good night, everyone. That's right. Stay when y'all get back out there, I know it's a lot of skinning and grinning and grinning, gripping, handshaking that goes on. I want to see some scowls and some some spitting and cussing because we got some serious <laughs> things to deal with. No handshakes these days. Yeah. Okay, no Let's handshakes. Go, man. <laughs> exactly. Good night. Good night. Get the elbow. <laughs> but we Wakanda forever. But we hear you. There it is. Wakanda forever, so Ebro. Wakanda forever, Sharpton. You know Wakanda it. forever, you know everybody. It. Now, uh, <laughs> Reverend Al Sharpton, any last words for the people? Uh, go ahead, Ruben Diaz. I'm sorry. One, one, real quick to Ruben. I don't. I don't want to. I'll wait for the ref. Go ahead, ref. No, all I want to say is I want. I'm on my way to Minneapolis to do the eulogy yes. Thursday, and I stayed because I didn't want Ebro talking about me like a dog to the young folks of Hot 97. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I yeah. really think this was important, and I think that significance of the two stations tying together to do this. So we're talking across generational lines. I give credit. Uh, to the stations for doing this and for Ebro for putting his heart in it, which is why he is who he is. But it shouldn't end with a conversation. We should be monitoring what all of us do, and we should be accountable what all of us do and report back what all of us do. Because like Ebro said, at the end of the day, yes, we made some efforts and some moves in many areas, but we all haven't done all we should and could. We should not sit back and congratulate ourselves. We all have to do more and we all have to make more happen. And I, I just want to say to you, I just want to say to you, Reverend, thank you because when we say all Blacks Lives Matter, Latinos, you're included in that. And, and, and Reverend Sharpton was there when Latinos were killed by the hands of the police. Reverend Sharpton was there for Puerto Rico and did federal time, 90 days. And for that, we thank you. Uh, to Ebro, thank you for showing that hip hop has a heart and a brain. Thank you for being so articulate, for bringing us all together. With regards to the looting, you know, I thought that one of the things that we should have been talking about today was the two, in the, one of the independent autopsy and the other one on, on George Floyd that says that he was asphyxiated. The oh, no, the, the medical the examiner hip -hop hip -hop. lied, and then they had to get the independent judge. Yeah. That's right. And it's important to know. And the reason I the reason I didn't get into Minneapolis too much today is because we got our own problems right here in the city. But, but, but Minneapolis is run by a Democratic mayor, a Democratic governor and Democratic politicians. They're having that problem in a Democratic run scenario. Right. That medical examiner lied. Let me just say this very quickly and go into the trap. We should have been talking about that in New York City. Now in the Bronx, we're talking about looting stores. And that's where it distracts. That's the trap. It distracts us from being focused and staying on message. That's facts. Ruben, thank you so much, sir. Everyone, Absolutely. thank you for your time. And wherever you tuned in around the world or just here in the tri-state, it's Hot 97 and WBLS. This was our town hall, police brutality, a little bit on COVID-19. We had to pivot from that, but that's still very real. Masks on, everyone. Masks on, social distance, social distance. Please, we are not out of the storm. We are not out of the storm. Stay focused, everyone. Thank you very much for your time.